One day, I walk in on a conversation that my brother's having with my dad. And my mom was there too, but she wasn't really, like, talking. Um, and my brother, who was 11 at the time, he was like, Oh, religion is a scam, Islam is a scam, and all that. And I'm, like, shocked hearing this. And I immediately, like, go into defense mode. I start defending religion. And I go, like, Faraz, you're wrong. But I was a little kid. And I didn't know what was right and wrong. I just... I just thought that what I had already learned was right, especially considering my trusty parents taught it to me. And um, I was kind of being annoying, not in what I was saying. Like, I, I'm, the more I grow up, the more I find myself being more and more forgiving of people being fools, because like everyone is a fool. But. I was being annoying in the way that I was butting in on their conversation. And then my dad, like, stopped me. And he stopped the whole conversation. And he's like, hold up. First of all, Afraz, like, Afraz is right, okay? Second of all, you can't just come in here and act like you know what's going on, okay? You haven't been a part of this entire conversation until now. You can't come in here, hear one thing, and then act like you have all the answers to all the questions you didn't even get asked them, all right? You're not a part of the conversation because you didn't get asked the question. And even if you were, like, here earlier and you did hear everything that was going on, you're not the one being asked the questions, so you're not a part of this, so leave. And he didn't say it exactly like that. Um, the reason why I'm interpreting it in a very harsh way is because that's what my seven-year-old brain imagined. It. He said it in different language. He said it in Hindi. But that was like my, that's what I got from what he said. And naturally, he probably said it in a very lighthearted, probably wasn't even saying it in a harsh way, but that's the way I took it. Um, that was probably like, that was the most devastating thing I had ever heard up until that point. I was like shook to my core. Nobody ever said anything like that to me before. Nobody had ever made me question myself like that. Like, like what was going on? Was my brother right? Well, he's usually wrong about most things because he's my brother, and that's just what brothers think of each other. Um, but my parents said he was right. But then doesn't that make my parents wrong? Because, like, at one point they said something, and now they're backtracking on what they said. So are my parents wrong now, or were my parents wrong then? Because either way, they were wrong, one way or another. And that was kind of like a bombshell at that age, you know? And not only that were they wrong, they were seriously wrong about arguably, at that age, the most important thing you could ever be wrong about. And I, like, ran away, not ran away, I ran to my room, um, which was a shared room with me and my brother. But I learned a lot that day. And I cried a lot. I, it was, it was um, like the most earth shattering thing ever. I can't even describe how I felt. Things just become really exaggerated when you're at that age. You know, the fun things seem way more fun and the devastating things seem way more devastating. And the one thing in particular that I'm so grateful for learning in that whole encounter is that not every fight is your fight. Like, even if it's right in front of you. I often found growing up, like, people will always try to guilt trip you when doing stuff. Like, people always say stuff like, oh, uh, why are you not um, advocating for social justice? Don't you know that there's these marginalized groups of, like, um, black people and women who don't get opportunities the same way white people and men do why do you just ignore politics why do you not care about these things you know you need to join in and do something to change the people of the world and, and educate them you know we need to talk about the the political and socio-economic state of the world you should be posting black lives matter on your page and you all this uh, my thoughts 
were like, dude, no, this is stupid. And I couldn't really pinpoint why, but now I can really look back at that and be like, it's not my fight. And I know that at the time, if I were to say that to them, it would sound really bad on my part because they they would be like, oh, so you only care about yourself. You don't want to help others. And I know if they brought up that point, I wouldn't be able to counter it. But now I can counter it. Now I know there's a myriad of ways that they're wrong. Um, first of all, if, if you're blaming someone for not helping a system to have less suffering when you're doing absolutely nothing as well, then they're not any more wrong than you are. You have no right to scold them on it. And even if you're out here donating, um, helping people in need, you know, let's say you're taking uh, 100 uh, impoverished, uh, poor souls every single day and turning their lives around for the better, you're still doing nothing. We live in a world of seven coming up on eight billion people, all right? You are doing absolutely nothing. Every time there's any sort of bad news about the world, oh, there's uh, there was a uh, there's slaves in China. Oh, there's um, government police attacks in India. Oh, there's the, like whenever there's any sort of bad news, you have to understand this is the news that we get for the whole world is only maybe one percent of the actual tragic news that goes on in the world. Maybe that. But it's probably not even close to 1%. It's probably way, way less. The only things that these people care about, like these white girls on Twitter who get offended on behalf of others, the only things they really care about is appearing and, and feeling good about themselves like they're a part of these other fights. When really, if they truly did care about the rest of the world, they would spread themselves so thin that they would basically become two-dimensional, okay? There is no way to make all of the world's fights your fights, okay? Everyone's like, oh, save save the pandas, save the pandas. Yeah, pandas are not even in any level of endangered species anymore. Like, there's so many pandas now that they're not endangered even in the slightest. People are so worried about pandas going extinct that there, there's millions of dollars going to... Um, panda conservation every year but what about the four or so species of bugs that go extinct every single day does anybody care about those well no and you know what and that's totally fine it's not your fight you don't care you like the pandas and that's good enough a reason you don't care about the bugs that go extinct that's fine Technically, on a technical level, if you truly did care about preserving life and about preserving all the species of the world and making sure a species doesn't go extinct, you would be losing your minds over the ungodly numbers of, um, you know, microorganisms going extinct like every second. But really, these people don't care. Really, these people are doing this based on their own personal opinions. And they're just too stupid to understand that. They're too stupid to realize that. They think that they're actually making a difference in the world. When really, you can make a difference in a million people's lives, and you will not have scratched the surface of making a difference in the world. In reality, on a grand scale, it's like if you take infinity and you add a thousand to infinity, it's still infinity. You haven't made a difference. The scale of the world and and the world's suffering and tragedies is so massive that it does not matter how much you do, you will not have a majorly positive impact on the world unless you are someone like Jeff Bezos or something like that, you know? But other than the very, very rare exception, and I'm not talking about Jeff Bezos for donating to charity, I'm talking about Jeff Bezos for creating Amazon. Amazon has created so much value for the world. That's what that's what it is. That's what did it. And unless you are one of these, you know, hyper rare individuals, you're not really making a difference to the world. 
You're only making a difference to what you think is the world. And what you think is the world is only what you immediately see around you, your surroundings. And on the internet, you get the false impression that these things are your surroundings, and you think that you're actually helping the world. But no, you're no better than someone who will have the mentality of saying, well, if I don't see it, it doesn't happen. Those kids starving in Africa, they're not here, I don't see them. So why should I help them? You're no different from them. If you're out here virtue signaling, oh, I'm going to donate to this charity that's helping it. You're not seeing them. It's only making you feel good. And it's been shown time and time again. Even the most charitable people, when they don't get the feeling that they're helping people, when they don't get the, the, the reward of being able to see what they are doing, they don't care. When you can give numbers to people and stats to people about the world suffering. They don't care. In fact, that actually makes it less likely for them to donate. But if you give them stories, and you show them examples, and you, you allow them to see where their money's going, it doesn't actually make a difference in what they're doing, but it makes them more likely to do it. And this is the case for all humans, and we should stop pretending like every fight in the world needs to be everybody else's fight. That was a bit of a... Um, like, this is just one example of how these, these people who try to guilt trip you into encouraging their virtue signaling is wrong. There's a, a million different ways that they're wrong. You know, I can, I can break down all these different ways. Like, oh, the victim, um, helping a victim doesn't actually help them. You don't, you don't give a man a fish, you teach him how to fish. But even then it's actually better if he learns himself how to fish. The victim rising up to the oppressor is the only way the oppressor actually backs down in the long term. You're not, you're not helping anyone by stopping any oppressors from hurting any victims. The victim has to stop them, not someone else stepping in. And there's another example. I can go into detail now. I don't want to go into detail on that right now. But um, also, there's this whole idea of people calling themselves victims. Just calling yourself that creates this social nocebo where they don't work as hard they don't try as hard to make themselves uh stronger they make excuses like um oh well i don't need to study as hard i mean it's not like i'll ever have any um as many opportunities as like a straight white man so why the hell would i bother giving it my all if there's no way i could ever make it to the highest levels of this game and that that's literally what ruins them like, it's not the straight white... Ma it's it's that mindset. Mindset is everything. Um, and, and perpetuating that mindset, encouraging that mindset, is just making things worse for them. And then there's the whole idea, which I can go into on a different day, about how raising awareness for issues doesn't actually work. Um, it's not persuading anyone. It only starts to make people more divisive and go further and further into their thought bubbles. The only people actually convinced by these white girls posting about um, BLM on their Instagram are other people who are already in agreement. But nobody who doesn't agree with that is going to go, oh, this white girl's posting BLM on her Instagram? Tuh, I guess Black Lives Matter. Oh, I, I didn't even think about that. I, I didn't know. Duh, this is so enlightening. Nobody's thinking that. That's never happened. It's... It's, um, there's a lot, there's many, many, many different, um, reasons, valid reasons that you can counter with when somebody tries to guilt trip you into, um, acknowledging that their virtue signaling is not signaling an actual, it's actual virtue. Um, but yeah. You look at like the state of what people have going on today, like, you know, in China, there's literally, I believe China has killed more people. Um, like the modern, modern day China, the surveillance state that it's become has literally killed more people that don't align with their homogenous genetic Chinese population. They've literally killed more people than Germany did during the Holocaust. 
Yet none of these people in America really care about that. These people go like, oh, if I was in Germany during that time, I wouldn't be. No, you would be. Because you're living in that time right now and you're not doing anything about it. You can, you can go to school right now and wear a t-shirt that has a hammer and sickle on it. But if you go wearing a swastika, you'll get kicked out. Not, no, no question about it. Even though, from a, from a utilitarian perspective, the hammer and sickle as an ideology has killed more people than the swastika. It's done more damage to the world than the swastika. Or, um, for example, what, what uh, Americans are so concerned with, like, um, 9-11 or attacks uh, in the Middle East and things like that, like bombings and terrorist attacks. Motherfucker, attacks like that happen in that area literally every single day. And a huge chunk of them are done by American governments. But most of the people who care about these issues, they only care when they're told to care. If they were to spend their time worrying, truly, truly worrying about every major issue, they would never do anything else. They, they don't ever think to themselves that maybe it's better for the world as a whole to decide to have a, or not even decide to have a threshold for what battles they want to be a part of, but to understand that they do have a threshold for what battles they want to be a part of, and they always will. And there's no getting around that, and to acknowledge that, and to understand that, and to admit that. And it's like, there's millions of people on Twitter that care about, like, crucifying someone for not making a gay wedding cake, or for um, making a t-shirt that says, coolest monkey in the jungle. All of those people don't really care about helping others. They only care about uh, fighting. They only care about, you know, choosing violence, basically. Because they're literally choosing to do that. They, they, they're they looking for a reason to get outraged. You fight the fights that you choose to be a part of. And when someone is not fighting the same fight as you, when they're not playing the same game as you, insisting that they fight alongside you and then guilt-tripping them into doing it, pressuring them into doing it, simply because they can't logic their way around your manipulative guilt trip methods and telling them they're a terrible person unless they join the cause, that makes you a despicable person. That makes you the one perpetuating the us versus them mentality and enforcing it onto others. That makes you the one who's not uh, following the like live and let live um, attitude. Because, you know, you have to appear oh so virtuous. Also, if you're, if you're really going to feel empathetic towards everyone, like if you're going to say rest in peace every time someone dies, you're going to, this is how you're going to live your life. You're going to go rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace. You're never going to stop. Every time some tragic injustice happens, if you're going to feel empathetic for everyone on earth, you will never stop being miserable. You have to pick and choose your battles. Not every fight is going to be your fight. And the sooner people learn that, the better. Because most of these people, not every fight is their fight, but they don't understand that. And they think that every fight is their fight. And so they have a very warped perception of reality. And I can go on and on about why these people are wrong, but back then I couldn't. I knew they were wrong, I just couldn't put it into words. But that's what this... this taught me I'm, I'm circling it all back when my dad told me like hey you're not a part of this nobody asked you so you have no say in what we're talking about but that's when i learned that i mean that that's where it stemmed from i've learned that over the years but not every fight is my fight and i don't need to make it as such because it never will be and it's a shame that a lot of people like, even my brother never fully learned that. Not to the level that I have. Like, he never stopped doing what my dad got mad at me for. I even remember telling my dad about it. And, like, like this was, I don't know, I must have been 16, 15 or 16 at the time. And I was telling my dad 
um, like, oh, thank you for that. You remember telling me that? Um, I'm so glad I learned that lesson. Um, and we started, you know, debating something because that's what me and my dad do. We basically never have a conversation without it turning into a debate. And then literally, like 30 seconds later, after this conversation, it was poetic. Because after this conversation, during this conversation, during this debate that I'm having with my dad about something else entirely, we're arguing about it. And my brother walks downstairs and he butts in and he goes like, Afraz, why do you argue like this all the time? Why do you act like this? Like, what's your problem? Like, that's literally what he says. And in my head, I'm thinking like, you weren't here. We're having a normal conversation and you don't know what's going on. This is not your conversation, so back off. But on the outside, I knew that he had never learned what I learned. He had never been through that. He had never had that like pivotal moment that I had that I believe is essential for people to stop being a little baby about everything. And you can't and you can't blame babies for being babies. So I just I just let it slide. And I didn't say a word. I find myself doing that a lot lately. Somebody's complaining, oh, why are you doing this? I don't even say anything. I have no business talking to them. Not, there's nothing to say to them. And I did that a lot around that time. So yeah, from the time I was 7 and he was 11 to the time I was 17 and he was 21, that part of him never really changed. He never grew up in that department. He never had that... um essential, in my opinion, essential experience in, in those formative years. Maybe seven is not what you'd call formative years, but it's a lot more formative than 17. And this is something I teach to kids a lot, by the way, that you don't need to fight everyone's fights for them. That sometimes it's better to let them fight for themselves. Sometimes the best thing you could do for someone is letting them be, even if you know they'll suffer. Even if you know they'll lose. And even if they do lose and suffer and they're in pain and, and it'll happen again and you know it will and it does happen again, sometimes they need to experience that for themselves to grow in the long term. To prevent that from happening when you're not around. I actually wrote quite a bit about this. And I, I taught a lot of kids about it. And I taught a few parents about it too. Um, about like making sure kids um, understand this concept of like not... Of realizing that the world is too big now. That not every fight is going to be your fight. And it can't be. So now you have to pick and choose. That's my contribution I made to um, develop... Mm, I'd say I made it to parental psychology. But I, it, it applies to developmental psychology more, I, don't, I think technically. But I, stop, I don't really care about de developmental psychology. I mean, it's not my fight after all.